few months ago, I took the big stick from the cupboard upstairs and I gave ETFs a little bit of a belting and produce this video here. And I looked at ETFs from the perspective of the absolute lunacy of the number of ETFs that are actually on the market. The stupid situation we have where there are ETFs that follow ETFs that follow ETFs of the underlying, which is simply ridiculous. I also looked at them from the standpoint of a business and the the vast majority of ETFs are simply not economically viable for the people who produce them. They're also not viable for investors or traders because of the lack of liquidity or volume in them. And this also takes into account US ETFs. I would consider only a third of US ETFs worth considering in terms of including in a universe of things I might look at. But the point I wanted to get across with that video is that ETFs are a wealth creation device, not for the investor. It is important for all people involved in markets to realise that financial products such as ETFs do not exist for your benefit. They exist for the benefit of the person who either provides market in them or the person who creates them. The idea is to take wealth from the individual investor and transfer it to the people who manage these sorts of tools. Once you have that as a guiding principle, you're in a position to actually decide how to use these to your advantage so that you don't simply become part of the fodder that is used to provide the lifestyle for people who produce these tools. But with that sort of thing in mind, coincidentally, a little while ago, Morningstar, which is a funds rating agency, produce this particular league table. This is the top 15 wealth destroying funds over the past 10 years. So in essence, what it does is it looks at those funds that have devastated investors the most. And it looks at the amount of money that they've ripped out of the system. What I did was I simply took that data and I've incorporated it into Excel because I want to highlight a few points. And there are a few issues with some of these ETFs that should be cornerstones of the way you view the market. But before I begin, a spoiler alert, I won't be looking at two of these in particular, and that is the iShares China ETF and the Van Eck Russia ETF. If you wish to invest in both of those markets, all I can say is good luck with your projects and you deserve the belting you're going to get. The first ones I want to look at are this notion of an inverse ETF. The one I want to concentrate on is the first one, the Ultra Pro Short QQQQ, which is an ETF that is the inverse of the ETF QQQQ. You can see how ridiculous this becomes very, very quickly, which in turn is an ETF that tracks the NASDAQ 100. So if we're to put this into context and give these ETFs a definition, an inverse ETF benefits from the price of the underlying falling in value. So this particular ETF is dependent upon QQQ falling in value, which is in turn dependent upon the NASDAQ 100 falling in value. When we have a look at how well this is done, because in the moment I mention NASDAQ 100 falling in value, you should get a hint of where this conversation is going to go. This is our particular short ETF, and you can see that since listing, it's been an absolute write off. And we can see why it's been an absolute write off when we look at the ETF. It is the inverse of. This effectively tracks the NASDAQ 100 very, very well. And you can see that since the period I have on the chart, 2014, that the trajectory of price has been up. Yes, there have been little hiccups along the way. But my view about those hiccups is they are best traded by utilising the underlying. The underlying gives you much more flexibility and much more bang for your buck. So if we go back to our inverse tool, this is one of the things I want to highlight. I could not get data on the average weekly dollar value traded, so I've done, uh, I've cheated a little bit. I took the closing price for each week, multiplied it by the volume and I get a figure of $12 billion. So each week, 
The turnover in terms of value for this ETF is $12 billion. If we assume that for every buyer there is a seller, and it's a little bit simplistic, but it does work for this case, you get a sense of the wealth destruction that has occurred by people investing in this particular instrument. So you have to ask the question as to why they would do so. Well, they do so initially on advice. They are actually advised to do so by someone else. A broker or financial plan or variant thereof says this is really good. You then have to ask the question and take the thinking one step further upstream and think, well, why would they say that? The only reason I can think of is the old idiotic notion that people have that if something has gone up, it must go down. The NASDAQ 100 has gone up, therefore it must come down. It doesn't have to. And it doesn't have to do so within the time frame of which you are investing or involved in a product. The market can stay irrational much longer than you can stay solvent. So if we go back to looking at the underlying, you can see that since 2023, what's been the predominant trend? The predominant trend has been up. This is a power trend. This is the inverse. It's a power trend down. Yet intriguingly, people continue to pour money into this vehicle. This is a wonderful exercise, an example of the utter insanity of the majority of market participants. I did mention there had been perturbations in the underlying, and there had. In particular, this one here, where the market slips in late 21 and slips all the way through to towards the end of 2022. And this is what it looks like on our inverse tool. Yes, there is a bounce and there is a trade out of congestion, but it's not much. So we come back to this notion of this is the wrong tool at the right time. You would be better off trading the underlying in this instance. It would give you more flexibility, more liquidity, and you would get more bang for your buck. This leads me to the second point I want to make about these particular tools. When people buy an ETF of any description, it doesn't matter which one, the last thing they do is read the product information. And this is the product information for this inverse ETF. And it goes some way to explaining the magnitude of the appalling performance of it. The easiest way to think about this is this is an inverse tool. And in simplistic terms, if the underlying goes up 1% because this is geared three times, this will go down 3%. That is a compounding return. So whenever you are presented with an ETF, something you're being encouraged to invest in, read the product disclosure statement. Go to the website of the people who have issued this tool and read what they are trying to do. This will also become apparent in a little bit when we look at a different style of ETF that has taken somewhat of a kicking. The second one I want to look at is ARK Innovation ETF because it highlights a particular rule that should be part of all traders' arsenal. This is the price of ARK. You can see massive growth through 2020. The fund ripped up from 30 to about 160, 165 in the space of a year. Remarkable performance. But I have a comment about that. And as with all comments, it should actually be backed up by evidence, and I can do that. There is a distinct delineation in this fund, and the delineation is split into two. And the delineation is one of luck, lack of skill. And you can quite clearly see where the dividing line between the two is. The point at which the fund took off and did exceptionally well was luck. When it collapsed, that's a lack of skill, or simply you've run out of luck. And if you are relying upon luck as a trader, then eventually it will run out. I said I could prove it, and I can. What I did was found the holdings of ARC, their prime fund, what I've done, there's a very good website called Cathy's Ark. It's named after the founder of 
arc, Kathy Wood, and what they've done is they've gone through and they've looked at the holdings of arc. And so I've taken some of that data and I've reorganised it. And what I've done here is you can see the weight ranking of it within the fund, the company, the ticker, the quote, when I last did this, their average entry price and their gain or loss. And you can see that the majority of their investments are underwater. And they're not underwater by a little bit. We actually have two that have lost 92% of their value. Some have lost 70%, some have lost 80%. That's an extraordinary display of a lack of money management and a lack of skill. But what is more intriguing is that as these stocks have been collapsing, this particular fund has been averaging down. And part of the reason they average down is their completely nonsensical valuations of many of these shares. And the valuations, if you listen to them and listen to what they're saying, have to use sort of a technical expression simply being pulled out of their asses because they're talking about prices not one or two orders of magnitude above where they are, but three as price targets, which is simply nonsensical. It reflects a complete lack of understanding of how markets work. But it is intriguing the amount of money people who do not know what they are doing can raise. In this next slide, what I've done is I've looked at the percentage gain required for those stocks that are underwater. And you can see, for example, that some of these stocks will need to gain over a thousand percent to get back to their break-even price. Again, something that is highly unlikely to happen. And when preparing this, I was reminded of a quote. Now, this rather grainy photo is of Paul Tudor Jones. Those of you who do not know what he is, Google is your friend. Educate yourself about other traders, please. And you'll notice the sign he has above his desk. Losers, average losers. If that is good enough for someone with a multi-decade history of tremendous success as a trader, it's probably good enough for you as well. Now, I did mention that I could prove the delineation between the two periods in ARC's history were based upon luck. In its early days, what ARC did was mimic a version of, and we're back to our old friend, QQQ, the ETF that follows the NASDAQ 100, and it did so in a geared way. So it follows the basic trajectory of the NASDAQ 100, but it, its performance is greater because it is geared. You can see the collapse, and you can see the crossover point where the NASDAQ 100 has continued. A more appropriate approach is to look at a geared version of the particular ETF and look at its comparison. And you can see something interesting. The track during the climb for ARC is almost perfect. They correspond very well with one another. TQQQ continues to climb, ARC collapses. They got lucky in the first part in that they had exposure to shares in a geared manner that were in some way, shape or form, reflective of this index. As the index continued, their performance should have continued as well, but it would have only done that if they dropped the losers and reoriented the portfolio. They didn't. In fact, they would have been better off selling up their portfolio entirely and following this ETF. All you would have needed to have done is run a moving average through it and you would have an entry and exit scheme and you would have done much, much better. The thing to note, though, and this comes back to the point I made about ETFs being a tool for wealth creation, but not for you. ARC continues to take anywhere between three and $400 million a year in management fees. That's a really, really, really good paycheck for having a drawdown that at one stage is almost 90%. It's a wonderful profession if you can get involved. So we come to this point. And that is that ETFs are useful right up until the time they're not. And I'll loop back to this point. 
The final one I want to look at is this PIMCO fund. It's a commodities broad basket. It is a fund that invests in commodities. Let me, let me rephrase that because that's not quite correct. It invests in commodities derivatives. And so I found a chart of this particular fund and you can see that it's currently down about 87% from its initial high. It's a dud. The question is, why is it a dud? And the reason for it being a dud is somewhat complex and revolves around the nature of futures trading. In particular, how futures contracts are appended to one another and how you deal with a rising market in futures. Let me use an example. The example I have here is USO, which is an oil fund, an oil ETF, versus the price of crude. You can see it consistently underperforms the price of crude. Why does it do so? It does so because the phenomenon known as contango. Contango is this notion where the forward price for a futures contract is higher than the spot price. What that means is that if you're a short-term futures trader and you're trading monthly contracts, in a rising market, every time you close that contract, you will pay a higher price for the next one. You're taking The market is taking a clip from you every time this occurs. So in terms of a simplistic example, let's assume you're trading a contract that closes month one at $100. So you sell it for $100. The next one you buy is quoted 105, 106. So you have to buy it at 106. You've now got an opportunity cost of $6. That process continues, and at the end of that month, you sell your contract for $120. All well and good, you made a profit. But the next one you buy is quoted $123, $124. You've taken a clip again. What funds like PIMCO do is instead of going deep into futures markets, they will trade monthly contracts. One of the things that is intriguing about this particular ETF USO is if you look at crude oil, there is depth in futures contracts out months and months and months and months and months. So you could negate this problem simply by being a little bit more strategic in what you do. But remember, ETFs are not set up for your benefit. So the fact that it doesn't track the price of oil very well does not in the slightest enter into the head of the people who manage it because they get paid irrespective of what happens. But for you, it is a cost. You would think that people who ran a commodities futures ETF would understand the notion of contango. Contango kills commodity ETFs in rising markets. It makes them pointless. Unless the commodity fund actually buys the physical underlying commodity as some gold ETFs do, they're pointless, they're useless. Trade the underlying commodity. Ignore anyone who says you should buy a commodity ETF because they simply don't know what they're talking about, unfortunately. But that is the default setting of most of the people who give advice around ETFs. A final point. ETFs can be useful for portfolio investors but you need right market, right time. And I should add an addendum to that, and that is right vehicle. Because as we've seen, the selection of vehicle is immensely important in your success or lack thereof. To give you an example, I will return to this geared NASDAQ 100 ETF. This has been used to immense effect by members of our trading boardroom. They have made vast fortunes trading this correctly in a particular way that is unique to them, but it is right market, right time, and right vehicle. Before you leave, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel.